Let's do a deep dive into mm -hmm. this. Let's start at the front, uh, all fall down. Mm -hmm. um, what a beautiful start yeah. uh, for starters. If you want an ethereal kind of super arpeggio and a cello, you are yeah. immediately sending a signal that you are reaching and for and tugging our heartstrings. Yes, it the album nails its colours to the mast from the start. You know, this is not an album that's kind of going to be in your face. This is something you need to kind of, you know, just lean your head into and, and really listen and and also yes a kind of a warmth and an emotion to it um and so yes and it i think it really does i mean you know I, I think the overarching theme of the record and why it's called midpoint is it's a, it's a it's an album about um the the sort of many storms that suddenly seem to appear on the horizon uh a certain point in life as you get older and I and I think when you're young you sort of don't expect it to happen but suddenly you know here I am and I'm full of questions about my life and where I've got to and a lot of it boils down to am I happy um, and I think it's a part of life that is quite difficult to negotiate and to get through and a lot of people self-destruct you know we, we know it from like the I mean, people often scoff at the cliches of the, the midlife crisis, but, you know, it genuinely is a thing and it's a can be a very dangerous time in life for people um, for sort of tearing stuff down and self-destructing. So, yes, and, and I think the, the, the opening song is is a, is exactly touching on that. It's, it's a it's you know, it's a I guess a song about when you f get to a point of depression, you know, where you feel kind of suicidal or you just feel there's no way out and i think it's a lot of things particularly for men of a certain age it's a it's a, a place that they can often end up in and they don't and they feel like oh you know i can't get out of this situation and it seems like there's only one way out and that's you know the you know taking your own life and that, that seems to me like a terrible terrible situation so you know the song is me trying to sort of speak to the listener and say you know, I've been through some dark times. If you just hang on, if you just hang in there, you you can find a way out. There w there will be an ending to the darkness, but it's it, you have to you have to sort of stay strong and and try and find a way through it. So tell me about this song. Yeah, rise and fall. I think is about um, do, sort of. I think I suppose uh, reaching a trying to or trying to at least reach a state of grace, right? Which is realizing that um you you can't really sort of control life <laughs> and and i think what i love about this part of life is just um you know just being able to sort of um go with the ebb and flow that there is now and i think when i was younger and the song s touches on this i think what i felt was like the answer to my inner sadness and my problems is out there in the world, right? It's 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 money, it's success, it's being adored by fans, it's those external fixes, drugs, alcohol, whatever. Those things are the things that will make me happy. And what I learned through the first yeah. sort of ten or fifteen years of trying all of that is that that doesn't happen. It doesn't work. You know, the the only way you get yourself you you fix an inner sadness is to make an inward journey and explore it. And do it with someone who understands the mind, you know, human mind, a human psychology, um, a therapist in my case. So it um, and and but I think you know, the, but the song saying you know, at the end of it, now I sort of live in a state where yes, there aren't huge soaring highs, there aren't these kind of deep depressing lows either. And but I sort of just bob along somewhere in the middle. And yes, things bad things happen, good things happen. But I'm trying to go through it with a sort of state of in a, in a state of grace. There's a line in the song about "Gone is the urge to steepen the curve of rise yes. and fall," which I think is the thing I that I did sort of um, unconsciously when I was younger. Wanted the huge highs, but also there was a part of me that sort of craved the huge lows that then came as a rebound to that. Mm. But yes, you're right. I mean, you can't you can't sort of you can't live sort of totally zen your whole life I yeah. mean that, that's unachievable and also not not a very profound experience of living so you're right but it's for me it's just like I don't want 
I don't want the kind of this the, the kind of huge distance between the highs and the lows anymore. I yes. can live I can live without that. Good. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad. Black hole. Yeah. Uh, we've come to I've I've noted my favourite so far. All right. Um, so and there's obviously there's a theme developing here. <laughs> um, and I'm I was uh, heartwarmed when you mentioned a deep love of the Beatles because there's mm. almost a Sergeant Pepper like oh, yeah. uh, yes. like a thing like a what what pastoral Sergeant Pepper like charm at the top of this. Good. So, I'm glad that I'm glad that comes across. Yeah. I mean we hammered it home, so I hope so. <laughs> okay, and then and then when the strings and backing vocals come in for yeah. the chorus, it just lifts mm. beautifully. It is is it a, a sort of a, one of those wolf in sheep's clothing songs? This? I, yes, that's a good way of describing it. I mean it what I mean one of the things I think that probably sort of sets in motion a lot of the questions about midlife is realizing your own mortality. Right, as soon as that becomes the background to everything that you do, you think, well, geez, I, I, I've, you know, for example, I better make the most of the time that I've got. Um, or for some people, it's like, ooh, I'm not happy in my relationship. I'm going to leave my wife or husband or partner, whatever, you know. It's, so, it's, so that background, I think, sort of shapes a lot of the questions that suddenly come up. And it's part of the reason I think why it's quite scary, because you think, oh, God, I've got to choose one option or the other right um and so yes i wanted to sum that up on in the song the thing is i've got quite a kind of cheeky view of death like it doesn't actually particularly the idea of it doesn't bother me particularly um and but i know people around me who get very who ruminate on it who get very um you know for, for whom it kind of it kind of takes over the, you know, the, the fear of their own mortality and it and sort of gets in the way of their own progress. Yes. <laughs> right. I think it's helpful if you just see it for what it is. All right. There's going to be an ending. And I that that should encourage me to do do the best, make the best, make the most of the time that I have. And so the song is kind of about that. It's, it's, it is tongue in cheek. And, and I think you, while it is a very if you just looked at the lyrics, you think, oh, my God, this guy is <laughs> so morbid. <laughs> <laughs> but actually the music, um, you know, the, the lyrics are actually pretty tongue in cheek. And the music itself is, as we discussed, it's very is kind of quite sort of playful and uh, and almost sort of a naive quality, particularly to the way the piano is played. So one of the takes that we did, you know, when we were recording the song it just just so happened at the end of it he ethan was playing drums and he went off into a little kind of marchy beat and so this is the great thing about playing live playing the songs live is that when he came to listen to all the takes it was like oh that's interesting we could we could do something even more silly and fun at the end of this which is to go into a little kind of reference to Mozart's Requiem. So yeah. there it is. I yeah, gosh, I I the the parts. I mean, we'll, we'll we'll talk about this a bit more. But the parts of the record that I enjoyed the most was when you just went rogue. <laughs> yeah, you know, so I'm you know I've got my my Keen thing, my Tom Chapman thing, but I you saw it. I'm just going to go off piste and into the powder. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I love I love the, those are the bits that I really love when yeah. you go a bit bonkers. Yeah, and you went a bit bonkers in this one. I certainly did. And, yeah. and, uh, and it's better for it, I yeah. say. Yeah, I think so. Um, who's arranging the orchestral parts because they're lovely? Well, well, again, interesting enough, that was that was Ethan, and he that that I know it sounds like an orchestra, but we actually did all of that on the Mellotron. Oh God, I love <laughs> the Mellotron, and so it was all layered up. Wow. By ear and just listening to the original music and then sort of layering that those orchestral bits up using the Mellotron. And in fact, the weird thing was that when we finished doing that, it sounded so like an orchestra that we had to try and sort of do you know clever tricks to it to make it sound a bit less like an actual orchestra because it was just it, it, the Mellotron sounds are so good. Uh, you know, there's there's such amazing samples yeah. that that it, it yeah it's almost too too close to the real thing. And if Ethan was telling me that actually when the when the when the Mellotron came along, the 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 music musicians unions got very upset about it because they felt like well this is going to take work away from us. <laughs> yeah. I mean, ultimately it didn't, <laughs> but um, you can sort of see why. We come now to. To stars align, mm -hmm. and we have uh, and we have an acoustic guitar for the first time yeah. on the record. And is that a bossa nova preset from one of those keyboards that you get given by your parents at Christmas? In the background of that, uh, <laughs> do you know no, what I mean? No, that is that's that's live congas, I think. 
Um, so no, well, that was all played live, but it but it's definitely got that feel to it, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah. We were trying to go for that kind of John Martin, Nick Drake kind of vibe on that song, um, and um, you know, I it, it it sort of got a, you know, the song is about kind of learning to go with the flow, and so you know, I think we wanted the it to have that feeling of sort of flowing along, sort of mellifluously. Yeah, and, good um, word. Uh, yes, yeah, so it, yeah, I hope we achieved that. I think we did. Um, and but I, I, I really that the lyric in that song is one of my favourite sort of lyrics on the record because I, I think it's you know it's about a sort of attitude that I now have to life, which is that um, well, well, in the first verse it says about you know um, you know when I was younger, you know, basically I had the wide, wide river dreams while missing out on tributary streams. You know, it's that thing of like if you're just thinking about going in one direction and that's it, and I want to achieve this and that's my goal, and I've got a five year plan and nothing's going to get in the way, you do that, um, you know, at your peril because you you might miss the little tributaries, the little diversions. And to me, particularly at this point in life, those are often the things that are much more interesting. Well, you know, I think, well, where's the energy? I think I might go that way yes. as opposed to thinking, right, I've got to stay in my lane and I've just got to, you know, be this thing that I imagine myself to be in the future. That I've learnt, trying to head for that place will only ever lead to disappointment. Yes. So it's better just to kind of... See, oh, that's interesting. I might do that, or I might do that. Yeah, I'm nicking that. <laughs> I'm nicking- I've often been surprised by the fact that, you know, when I've done something that I thought, oh, that's a bit interesting and a bit weird, it's opened up a whole new realm of stuff that, you know, it's not always just what it looks like. Yeah. There's often more to these, to these diversions that you take. You know, for example, making solo music. I just... I, I, it com- confounds me, like constantly just how many amazing musicians I keep meeting and people and they're all slightly different and they've all got a different style and a different way of doing things and they're all amazing yeah you know and I'd never have had that had I not decided to sort of break out of Keen and 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 meet new people and try different stuff and it, it so you know that's just an illustration but yeah. I think there are lots of those kind of oh, things in it's, life now. it's amazing what you know people it's just people musicians yeah. are people but you know uh, just one random musician can completely change a room and I, yeah. I was talking about this today because it's Billy Preston's birthday today as we talk to each right. other the, the absolute legend yes indeed who and have you seen Get Back the Beatles of course absolutely right? yeah you, so you know he changed that room with his smile and his vibe it, what was great about um get back is it came back at exactly the time that we were making the record and obviously ethan's dad glenn was the producer on, oh my God, of on the record so glenn was, johns yes. ethan johns yes yes so it was very weird seeing um yeah so, you know, glenn uh there's obviously a fam a big family resemblance and obviously ethan was very interested in the documentary as well and so, but i was thinking it was so weird for him seeing his dad as a young man yeah and the way that peter jackson had brought it all back to life so it felt like it was filmed yesterday yeah <laughs> you yeah. know and, and but I, I did yeah I think it must be very peculiar for Ethan to see well in fact he said it to me seeing my he said seeing my dad as a young man and in fact at the time he was uh, he his Ethan's mother was pregnant with him so Good God. that yeah so God, it that was, must um, have been an emotional experience a very strange <laughs> unemotional experience one, yeah. But yeah he he really loved it actually too I think he felt like it was like he said, having grown up around the guys from the Beatles and um, having had a lot of interaction with them. He, you know, he said that they've all been so private over the years and so careful about curating what comes out. And to see this film, which is so, I mean, there's so much access to your heroes. It's just, it was just mesmerizing yeah. i can't wait to watch it all again yeah. now we come to colorful light mm-hmm. so we've got another off kilter intro here yeah. and you're you know uh, again i like it when you go bonkers right you've gone a bit bonkers again and and I, it really works in a yeah. in in a very like inspiring way it's lovely good yeah um, that's one so, of my favourites off, off the record, actually. Yeah, tell me about it, and then I've got a sp- very specific question about, a, about okay. a, an instrument that you play here. Yes. Um, <laughs> well, it, so the song is really about how we are the sum total of our experiences. You know, and, and, and like people often say to me, oh, would you rather not have been an addict, uh, you know, or 
not you know what do you regret and all of those things and of course it's a it's a bit of a kind of daft question uh, anyway but but actually I always think I'd much rather have had all that stuff happen to me because it's made me who I am you know as we were saying earlier on like experiencing the lows uh, you know, you learn from those things and it helps you to grow as a human being. And I think that, yeah, so the song is very much about that, about sort of it's, you know, w yeah, when I sort of look at myself, you know, there's there's a, the, the, through, so there's a line in the song, through the prism of my heartbreak, a rays of colourful light, you know, so it's sort of like you, do, you don't get the beautiful colorful light without having had the heartbreak you know you have to as we as you said earlier on you have to have you can't have one without the other that's the game right yeah. We're all, we've all got to just play it right yeah, <laughs> so, I, I, um, my, so i wanted to try and to sum that up in a kind of poetic way with the song and I, yeah i feel, feel like it, it more or less achieved it um so what is that gorgeous instrument that comes in about two minutes in? It's my favourite, it's my new favourite instrument. What, what an instrument. Is it? Is so, that Middle Eastern? Is it? Kind is it? of. So, Armenian. Ah! Um, so, it, we ha there, was a, there, was a, there was an empty space in that song, uh, which we always had something in mind for. We weren't quite sure what. And again, I have to hand it to Ethan. That was that was totally his idea. He he sort of sat there, which he, which he has a tendency to do, sort of quietly, sort of stroking his beard and rocking in his chair. <laughs> and he said, "You know what I think this song needs? I think it needs what is that instrument? What is that thing?" And he <laughs> told you know, Dom, who's who is his engineer, sort of looked at him blankly. He said, "It's a, it's it's, it, I it's like a kind of reed instrument, but it's like a kind of fluty type thing." Anyway, they eventually they said a duduk which is an Armenian instrument. And so he said, right, we've got to... He, said, he was like, we've got to find ourselves a duduk player. So he, um, he just went on a hunt. And um, there is one guy who plays um, duduk in this country. He's an Armenian guy called Tigran Alexayan. And he was... I mean, it was so brilliant when he came to the studio. He kind of rocked up. He was a bit kind of hot and sweaty. And he'd, you know, he'd, he'd come all the way out of London to, into Oxfordshire to the studio. And he kind of, but he, as soon as he arrived, he was, he wanted to, he was so enthusiastic about his instrument. And he had all the different types of duduks. And there are different, you know, he had A duduk and D duduk, which are in different keys. Of course. And, and so he tried them all out. And I mean, as soon as he started playing, it's got this lovely kind of lyrical, lilting, beautiful tone it's just just amazing like uh you know you just add a splash of reverb to that and it's just like this it, it's just gorgeous <sighs> but almost impossible to play i mean like genuinely you know you have to be very skillful really? to play that instrument i would say yeah um, did you try oh yeah just <laughs> fart noises came out of it when i tried it was hopeless so we come now to to it's over which is uh, a phrase that we've all obviously all heard or, or said and can put <laughs> chills can put chills down your spine. Um, nice, to be, nice to be in Walt's time now, yes. on this one. Yes, indeed. Um, the production feels very retro. There's, there's yeah. a slight shift, it, I felt, in the production. Almost 60s. Yeah, Beach Boys vibe, uh, I think we yeah, were going and, for. And again, there's a bonkers sound that floats in. The middle eight, you went, you've gone bonkers with the oh, sound again. Reverse guitars. Oh, we went full 60s, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, that song, because I actually wrote that a long time ago. Um, and I wrote it about a friend of mine who had been in a very long-term relationship, had kids, split up with his wife. And it was and it was all, you know, it was the first time anyone in my life I'd seen that happen to them close up. And it was very, you know, it was very unsettling and very sad and watching the fallout from all of that. So in a way, you know, again, in terms of the context of the record, it felt like a I thought I've always wanted a place for that song and I felt like oh wow this could be it because it's almost like a kind of even though it's not about my life particularly it's a sort of it feels like a cautionary tale to myself it's like you know this is this is what can happen these beautiful relationships that get forged in a in a different time with dreams and um an idea about you know living a life together and then you know and all the stuff that you learn together or the things that you experience the kind of unspoken stuff and the language that you have with each other that no one else has got you know how that 
how that can suddenly come to an end, you know, 15, 20 years down the line. And how awful that is, really. You know, that, that's so, so sad. You know, I'm sure, you know, plenty of times it happens for the right reasons. It can also happen for the wrong reasons. Yes. And, that, you know, particularly when there are kids involved, but even just for the couple, it's a, such a sad thing um, when that's lost. And, I, and I've seen it with people. You know, they sort of, they carry it with them. You know, it's like a, a part of, a huge part of them has gone, has disappeared. Um, and I, so, yeah, so I sort of felt like it was a, an interesting thing to write about and yeah to sort of yeah like i say sort of revive it in terms of the the putting it on this album even though it was an old song well I it's find. funny because i've i've finished this record in december of last year so i've had a long time alone with it and it's and it, that's quite a scary thing to have with an with an album is to sit with your own music without it having its own life you know because well, as soon as you release it it has its own life in the world and there's this is a relief actually uh, and and the the songs aren't really yours anymore, and so and I and, and so I love that about making records. But I've had, I've lived with this a long time, and because it is very different to Keen albums, because as you say, there's quite a lot of I took a few gambles on it and did stuff that is not necessarily what my default is as a musician. And also just because it's so bare, it's, it's not, not like a kind of overproduced record. It's like, oh my, you know, I've, I've had some real wobbles over the last kind of eight, nine months about, about the album. Um, so it's very gratifying to now have it out in the world and to hear people say, that's, that's one of the things we love about it is, yeah. is all of those elements that you've been fearful of. So um, yeah. yeah, it's nice to hear that. Often the way. Uh, so we come to the title track. Yeah. Uh, to midpoint, and you've got you've got an ethereal beginning that's almost worthy of an album opener. Yeah. So it's kind of just that it is, you know, the the, the title track, and and we're sticking with three beats to the bar as well. We're we're staying. We're, we're, yeah. We're, yeah. Well, yes, with, I guess so. With 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 a triplet. There's yes. like triplets in the four somewhere. Yes, in exactly. Here, in triplets here. in the four. Yeah, that's yeah, that's exactly go. right. Yeah. Um, it's sort of hinting at what happens at the end. You know, which is where it does go into sort of six eight time. And and, and um, echoing what you just said, you need know, the arrangement is is it's for the most part just beautifully stripped yeah but in that it's actually much more complicated than <laughs> yeah. it than it first sounds isn't it yeah the, particularly down the low end there's a lot of stuff going on and so if you listen to it on a just on you know on an iphone speaker or whatever you won't you you won't get the full uh full beans of the song you know you want you you need to, i mean i think for the most part with this album listen to it on a great stereo or listen to it with headphones particularly because of moments like midpoint which is yeah which is about yeah it's because of all of that rumbling in the low end and the little this it's it's all about the subtlety of what the synths do and the guitar the acoustic guitar does and you know just yeah um and little sort of touches of um other synths that come in here and there you know, it's very yeah. I I love the way that that's produced. Like I, you know, for me it's like, you know, being sparse. Particularly having made Keen records for so long, being sparse is scary. But with this song, it didn't feel that way. It felt like, oh, this is all right. I can be sparse with this one, and it feels okay. But then, but then it kicks off. <laughs> yeah. Then it kicks off. You know, I I love this because it's got everything. Mm. It's got the the lovely tender, quiet bits. Mm. That, that you could almost feel like it's almost like a butterfly's wing. Yeah. But then you've yeah. got, you're throwing in, well, not everything but the kitchen sink, but like, Pretty much. you know, you've got <laughs> an even ele a rasping electric guitar comes in there yeah. and, and, and it's, uh, it's like, haunt but actually haunting yeah. uh, as, and, and, and epic, but in a very, it's, it's, it's a, in a very non kind, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's not all the whole kitchen sink, but it, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's full without being, too full, you know. Yes, I think that's like a friend of mine, who's a producer, said to me before I started working with Ethan. He said, "Oh, I love Ethan. He's got exquisite taste," and it and really stuck with me. Him saying that, and I, I wanted to see what he meant by that when it came to. It. And I think this song is probably a good example of that. Just picking the right instruments at the right time. And as you say, if yes, in one hand it does feel sort of like this big at the end, but it's also is carefully thought out. So I really love that about him. I mean, the 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 song is probably my. I would say probably my favourite song on the record, or up there anyway, and and also like a, one of the songs I'm most proud of having written or been involved with as a musician. I think because like what we were saying earlier on about the sort of journey, it's a bit of a journey and a process through midlife, um, and 
what I was saying about that sense of the, on the other side is something really hopeful and beautiful. I, I think the song tries to do all of that. It goes from this place of like um, inward melancholia and fear about kind of dwindling passion um, and to, to a point of like, actually where I want to be is back with the ones that I love. And then the end is, and then the end of the song, the final progression is, you know, don't worry, while standing tall, salute the wonder of it all. Don't get sort of bogged down in worrying about, you know, your life and all the decisions you've made. Is it, try and step out of that and realise what an amazing mystery it is to be a human being and to be sentient, right? Mm. And, and and to live in, a, in the world that we do, you know, which has its problems, but also... It's full of amazing, beautiful people and beautiful achievements and beautiful the beautiful natural world. So, um, yeah, I sort of wanted to, to try and sum that journey up, which is the kind of journey that I've been going on myself over mm. the last few years. One of the things that happens with every, pretty much every record in, these, in this day and age is that everything is compressed. So if you look at the sound wave, of a of a song, even a quiet song these days, it's just basically a big block. Yeah, you know everything is at the same level. Yeah, and Ethan cannot stand that. I mean, yeah. he's so he's he's fighting a kind of almost lone battle against all of that. But there's huge. So when he mixes a record, there's huge dynamic range. Yes, in it. So there's there's always space. He allows space. There's always somewhere to go to. You don't start you know, full guns blazing and then try and squeeze out even more by the end. You start you start with enough room. If you're going somewhere bigger, you need to start with enough room. And that's yeah, so so that's why it's not a kind of I don't it's not like an overly loud record. If you want to hear it loud, you need to really turn it up. Yes. <laughs> Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. But that's that's a good thing. It's got dynamic range. It was funny when we mastered it, like, you know, listening to the engineers say, well, you know, uh, if we look at the sound wave, uh, we need to turn this, this to be competing with everything else. We need to turn this up nine decibels, which is a huge amount of volume. <laughs> yeah, Normalise right? everything. Yeah. Know, Ethan was like, "No, no." He says, I, "I'm absolutely not standing for that. I'll maximum four, you know." And that was it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. That, but I, again, I think it's a it's a positive. I like that doggedness. Make people turn it up. Yeah. If they want it loud, they can do it themselves. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. rather yeah. than prescribe it. Indeed. We come to panoramic eyes. Yeah, so, I mean, the song is, um, it's a very poetic song. Um, and what I was trying to achieve with it was to try and capture um, that sense of, that, that every now and then happens in life. Um, and it can be whilst you're uh, playing sport or whilst you're playing music or whilst you're meditating or even just in odd places where you are suddenly it's almost as though your ego dissolves and you are in a place that's sort of removed from your own body a sort of out yeah it's you know a kind of uh, ethereal blissful experience um it doesn't happen very often and of course as soon as you realize you're there it's too late you're, yeah yeah <laughs> you're, you're back in your body but but I think what I was trying, yeah, so, but that, that has happened to me, you know, on occasions, sometimes drug induced, but, but often, you know, induced by playing music or playing sport, in fact, and things like that. So um, I wanted to try and sort of sum that feeling up of that kind of, uh, of sort of the ego melting away and this sort of entering a kind of, you know, more cosmic consciousness for, for you know, I'm sounding like an old hippie here, but, you know, it's sort of, I think it does, I think that that's, like that does sometimes occur in life, and I was really wanted to sum that up in a in a song. It's why it's got that kind of hypnotic, meditative thing, and the song is kind of you know it's it's heading in that direction from the beginning. It sort of wants to go, and then there's this big after the sax solo, there's this big chorus at the end where you feel like that's here we are. We're in the we've attained our moment of bliss. Well, you're talking to someone who's meditated every day right. since 2013. So, <laughs> you know, enough. you're not coming across tree huggy <laughs> at all. The gravitational mm. we come to now, which is, uh, this is your lead single from yes. the album. Yep. And I'm guessing the one that your label, it's the jauntiest and most up-tempo. So <laughs> yeah. the label must have gone, well, you, we've got to go for that one because that's, the, you know, this will get played by the radio. Exactly. It, it, it's, it's the one that sounds most like a, a keen record. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's in a sense, in that sense, the most predictable one. Yeah. But, um, 
but you know, I, I, for me, I enjoyed the parts of the album. It, it's not a fair reflection of right. the record. In a way, it's not. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it's the, the six, six and a half minute full wig out. <laughs> I think when it when it goes into that full wig out at the end, that's more of a reflection of where the album yeah. ended up. But you're, you're right. I think the bare bones of the song is probably more. You know, it's more, it's more mainstream, it's more more keen or, or whatever, um, sort of appealing in that direction. Um, and it's a love song as well, you know. So, of course, uh, it's another reason for, for people to cotton on to it, in, in, you know, when they're, when they're thinking about the business. So uh, we come to New Flowers. Mm-hmm. And the thing that struck me when I listened to this was how, how nice it is that you sing in your own voice, in your own accent. Right. Do you know what I mean? You're, it sounds you sound English, and there's yeah. something very charming about that. And a yeah. lot of singers choose to go down that I'm going to sing in somebody else's language part. Yes, and there's a there's a real honesty. There's a very literal honesty to that. Yeah, I always love that. You know, I I, I think um, yeah, yeah. To me, it would feel strange if I was trying to. Well, in fact, I think I probably did when I was younger. I did try and emulate or even copy other singers i went through a massive sort of tom york phase because i was sort of similar world vocally timbre yeah exactly yeah. um and obviously you by going through those different stages you, you might learn stuff from it It helps you to find your own voice yes. but, but you know finding your own voice is really important and um you know this record is meant to be kind of it's meant to be partly kind of conversational and, and confessional and uh, sort of spoken in your ear and I would yeah so I have to do that in my own voice sometimes I do I, I, I'll find I'll think oh I'll put a note on top of my lyrics saying stop singing an American accent because you know, it'll <laughs> creep in it's, an, it's, an, it's sort of part of the DNA of pop music isn't it yeah um, but um, yes no, I'd much, much rather be you know have the English accent that I have um, in my singing Definitely. Well, it, well, it chimes with that whole pastoral charm thing that right. crops up in this yeah. record. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's I think that's a that's a strong thing. It's a strong identity. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we come to uh, where are we in the home straight now? We are in the home straight to cameo. Yeah. Uh, obviously, nothing to do with the eighties uh, pop rock funk band who wore cod pieces. Oh, okay. Although that would be absolutely fine. That's that's yes. I'm not aware <laughs> of cameo. Cameo but that sounds. Word so, up, come on. Right. Word up. What? No, no, no what? that's not that's we, not on my jo, radar. Your 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 people, Joe, on the other side of the glass, is is shocked. Right. Maybe I do know the song, but yeah, I, you, I'm uh, yeah. You I can't yeah, put you, two and two together. I guess you're so young compared to me. Right. Um I, you, No comment. Yeah, word up. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's more of a kind of old fashioned rocker, I suppose, cameo. It actually went through a couple of iterations. When I when I wrote it, it was like it was in a different key. And it was very, it was like a bit like a song from The Greatest Showman. It was like full on melodramatic. And it was, it was great. I mean, I loved that version of it. Then the first version that Ethan and I did was more like a kind of Paul Simon song and had a bit of a groove to it. But it was the one song where we thought, mm, we're not, well, I thought it's not, it, it sort of didn't feel like, I mean, it was a really interesting version of it, but I just felt like it's some, something, it, but felt a bit lacking so we actually went back and re and redid it um and we went for a more sort of straight rocker vibe it's got that like, lovely little beatlesy guitars but I, I really like that song it's like a you know i think it, and it works well at the end of the record because it's sort of like it feels like it's a song about um uh what we were saying earlier on about wanting to make the most of the time that you have and you know i think People say that like, when you're younger, you know, it's a, in a way, it's the curse of being young. So you don't realise how lucky you are. <laughs> uh, as you get older, you realise, oh, well, time is precious and you have to make the most of it. And, you know, I, and I think that's, yeah, that's the attitude I have towards everything I do now. Even if it's, even if it's just loafing around the house, I still try and remind myself to be present and think, Ah, look at you, you know, <laughs> here you are. This is a, 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 and sort of, you know, and not to let life wash over me. And I suppose cameos, yeah, it's, it's like a kind of, well, here's the term again, call to arms about sort of trying to make the most of, of every second, whatever you're doing. Overshoot. Now, you've got, I really enjoyed this as a, mm. as a 
as a last track. Did yeah. you write this as a last track or did it did it just come and then you thought, this is how we want to it move people? It always looked like it was going to be an ending just because of the imagery in the song about the sort of, you know, the ship going down yes. and, and oh. all of that. I mean, I think it, it's really interesting now the record's out there. I've had a bit of interaction with people today on social media and yeah, it's definitely one of the ones that's popping out as a favourite. Um, and it's like, I think it's a, it's a love song um, that can only come from experience. Do you know what I mean? I think, like, I couldn't... This is not an album where I'm trying to sort of write about young love or, you know, I'm not trying to sort of do something that is, is not true to me now. You know, this is a, I've been with my wife nearly 20 years. And um, so we have a very kind of... Uh, yeah, we're, yeah, we have a, a sort of... A very deep sort of relationship. There's sort of... And, yeah, and I... And so the song is saying, you know, sometimes I sort of wonder about tearing that all down and starting again. But actually, really, I don't... When I, when I really think about it, it's not what I want. And, and actually, what I really hope is when the ship goes down, i.e. when the end comes, that we're, we're still together and still believe in each other. So it does, yeah. So it feels like a... It could only really have gone at the end of the album. It's such a good buy. Yeah. You know, and I think uh, along with uh, Midpoint, sort of th- that feels like some of my best bits of writing as well. I just love the lyric in that one. Yes, yes, absolutely. And also, I really enjoyed the tension between the two note initial piano line yeah. and your melody. Yeah. There is a real tension there. Yeah. And, and that. That was I mean, that's you out of feels like really out of your comfort zone songwriting. Yeah, wise. well, the the tension is de- you know it's very because the, the the verses are about particularly the opening verses. You know, sometimes I feel like I could run wild, tear the fabric of our life, cut and run from the world that we've been building. You know, so it's it's got that sense of you know <laughs> I'm I'm feeling like I might tear this all down. And then, so that piano doing that kind of nagging, you know, thing, uh, sort of unsettling thing, sort of perfect for it, really. And then, and then the chorus is, it's like, oh, you sort of breathe a sigh of relief. So like, with a little luck, we'll be dancing, you know, when the ship goes down. So sort of, yeah, sort of, yeah, musically, I think that it, it, it was a like I, I was obviously there was talk about that song being a single, but the way that. Ethan's produced it. It's just so so unsingly. It's, like it, it's so stripped. It, yeah, it's, it's so, so stripped. It's so but, bare. But, but um, so we have actually. Yeah. Well. Anyway, maybe I shouldn't be touching on. There is another version. So because I I was I just want that song at least to potentially have another um, a, a, a chance of being out there in the world. So there is another version. Of good. It. Good. I mean, Tom Grennan has fifty versions of every song. You know, just yeah. did one for every radio station. <laughs> yeah. Like, although I think with with this album, it did feel like I wanted to sort of make it a purely artistic statement. So kind of deviating and doing different versions and stuff is <gasps> it, it slightly fills me with dread, just because it you know that's the only way of getting on the radio or whatever. Yeah. You know. So, but but I think the thing I felt like I, I did when I set out to make the album I wanted to make it a purely artistic statement and I didn't want it to have you know I, did, I was like I don't care about you know commercial success or anything but of course you get close to the time and you think oh I'd love people to hear this record so yeah. maybe I do want some radio play and sort of you know then you have to do a bit of um, tail wagging the dog and try and <laughs> sort of um, create, create sort of some some songs or moments that, that will have a chance so um, yeah so, so if it helps for people to, so that people end up hearing the album as a whole, I think it was a positive thing. Are you going to play it live? Because that is a big note to hit. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Are oh, you yeah. all right? Are you, you're you're easy with that. Yeah, well, with- it, but my voice, I think, is probably is sort of. I mean, I I gave it um, some real abuse over the years. Like obviously, all my drug taking and the late nights and the benders and all of that stuff that I went through. You know, it's interesting when you hear Elton talk about, you know, his his problems. Like, it ruined his voice, really, let's be honest. I mean, it, you know, he's still a great showman, and but all the songs are down a load of keys, and yeah. they, they don't have the same presence and excitement, I don't think. You know, so I'm, I feel very lucky that I didn't destroy my voice completely. And in fact, you know, the the it mercifully, it survived intact. And so, uh, you know, and I feel like it's sort of, it's it's more or less I, I would imagine sort of you know the opera singers and 
so forth say this but he said this is the time of life where it kind of peaks where you've got the best control over it and it's still got its it's sort of you know there's a there's a youthfulness still to it so so i sort of feel like i'm, I'm not too worried about the big notes is, is the upshot of this <laughs> long answer to your question um yeah so the big notes i welcome them excellent good i'm glad to hear it and you know just Coming back to that last line, the very last line of the song and therefore of the record, when the ship goes down, uh, we'll we'll be dancing. Yeah. What a what a beautiful! It's such a great metaphor for just being in the moment. And I think the wheel be dancing is important as well. Like life when it's solitary. I mean, I like solitude, but it's so important not to be alone. I mean, I suppose that's what the opening song is saying as well. It's like life has got to be relational. You've got to live it with other people you know and sort of um sharing it with other people otherwise what's the point you know so yeah so i sort of feel it's a good it's a really yeah that sort of sense of we're in it together at the end and the beginning of the record is is a good way of bookending it well yeah well said (laughs) um so gosh you know we've come to the end and uh and it's a beautiful ending um so and you're you're not at the end. You're at the, you're at the half. You're at half time with the orange segments <laughs> of your life. You know, s- yeah. Saturn is it going? This I I've, yeah. I've spent the weekend with people like Kirsty Gallagher, right. who's this amazing lunar sort of you know aware woman. And so she would say that that Saturn has gone all the way around the universe and it's come back to right. where it was when you were born. That's wow. And it's never been in, you know, in your sort of heavens until that's yeah. this whole kind of like half time yeah. m- midlife crisis you said. But it sounds like you're not in a crisis. It sounds like you're in a midlife renaissance, maybe. Um, how, how are you well, really feeling? Yeah, well, I well, certainly over the last few years have felt troubled by the onset of midlife. I think that's and I think that's what I wanted to convey. Like, though, there's definitely big scary questions and big hurdles to be overcome at this point in life but yes i mean as you can see i feel like i've sort of negotiated my way through that and i do feel very positive almost bullish about the next stage you know i know myself now and that's really good i know what i like come to terms with that i'm very happy with my wife and my kids and the and the home we've got you know, but it's taken me a while to really come to terms with that. It's been there's been judders and you know, has shaken all of that stuff. And I'm happy with making music as well. You know, I'm not thinking, oh, you know, I want to be. You know, I see. Well, I've been, you know, watching like Coldplay, for example, playing at Wembley. You know, there's a part of me that, oh God, I'm so envious of those guys. Mm. <laughs> you know, but but I'm also thinking, well, that's you know, that could have been me. And if things had gone differently with Keen, maybe that maybe we'd be doing that as well. But it's not, you know. And I'm just so I have to sort of accept that and and also say, well, okay, well, I'm I'm so I'm still able to make albums and still able to express myself in this way. There's enough fans to keep it going, and that's a really wonderful thing. And it's kind of more in balance anyway, you know. So yeah. So that's just an illustration. So I so I'm yeah. So I'm yeah. In in most departments of my life I sort of feel very hopeful and and positive about what what lies ahead and well what's happening now too good well don't don't worry and don't be scared (laughs) every single every single decade that I've entered you know in the 30s I was like oh this is the best decade ever and then when I got to the 40s it's like this is actually much better than the 30s and then when I got to the 50s it's the best under where I am now it's the best ever yeah so yeah the, tra- the trajectory is good. Yeah, I think so long as you can keep going like that. Like, I think if you, if you, yeah, the scary thing is if it's going in the other direction and you're hankering for the past and you think, oh, my best days are behind me and, oh, I wish I was, I wish I could be more like I was when I was 18. And do you know what I mean? But, I, and I think that does, that is a, a something that kind of grips quite a lot of people. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and it's very sad, you know. So, yeah, we're lucky. I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> we feel this, this way about about this part of life. We're both doing something that we absolutely love. Yeah, absolutely. Tom, it was really lovely to meet you. 
Thank you, Eddie. Cheers, and mate. I, yeah. I, I look forward to the next to the next conversation the ne- and see where you are for the next one. <laughs> sure. Hope it hasn't all collapsed by that point. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, a break-up album. I'm here for you, man. Rehab. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>